a million times a million, completely shocked husband said, my life was perfect until one day this happened. Like them, I thought my life was perfect until one day it wasn't. I'm Blake Ramsey. At 31, I was a happy and contented person. At this stage of life, everything was going well. I had a great job doing space projects for a division of a large aerospace company called Space Conquest, and I was making good money. We were working on a NASA contract to develop the next generation of manned spacecraft after SpaceX Dragon and Boeing Starliner. It was supposed to be a winged spacecraft that landed like an airplane. Unlike the space shuttle, it was intended only for passengers. There were eight of them. It is a bit like the Air Force's X-37B, only bigger. Like the X-37B, it would land entirely under automatic control, without any pilot input. My part of the project involved an evacuation system. In case of failure, each crew member would eject in their own pressurized capsule. Exit can be initiated during any phase of flight, launch, and ascent, as well as at any time during atmospheric re-entry. It was a space engineer's dream job. I had a wonderful wife of seven years named Tracy and three beautiful children, a seven-year-old boy named Tyler and six-year-old twin girls named Beth and Emily. My wife and children were the center of my life, and I tried my best to ensure that my work did not interfere with my time with my family. My parents were alive and in good health, as were Tracy's parents. Both sets of parents lived an hour away, doted on their grandchildren, and visited us whenever they could. In addition, Tracy's married sister Lucy lived nearby. Tracy and I had a four-bedroom house in an upper-middle-class neighborhood with great neighbors. Tyler had his own room while the twins shared a room. We left the fourth bedroom for guests. After all, every girl will need her own bedroom. When that time comes, we will finish the basement and turn it into an apartment. I met my wonderful wife, Tracy, while in graduate school in college. Between my bachelor's degree and my master's degree, I served four years in the Marine Corps to qualify for veterans' educational benefits. She was younger, and we quickly fell in love. We got married a month after graduation. I graduated from university with a degree in aerospace engineering and found a great job. When Tracy graduated from college, she went to work at a law firm as a paralegal. Tracy quit her job two years later when she gave birth to our son, Tyler. Only a year later, Tracy gave birth to our twin daughters. Our life was perfect. Beth and Emily went to kindergarten. Tracy returned to work at the law firm. I should have seen this coming, but I was blinded by my faith in my wife's complete fidelity. I thought she was in love with me as much as I was in love with her. Looking back, I see that all the signs were staring me in the face. Tracy began to dress more provocatively. Our sex life went from frequent to much less frequent. Tracy worked longer hours and was dismissive when I asked her about her excessive time at work. When I confronted her about the lack of quality time with both me and our children, she told me that she worked for a senior partner. She told me, this is a great career opportunity and will help us financially in our future. I met her boss, Stanley Cross, several times before the day, at several social events, and at the company Christmas party. He was the senior partner who founded the law firm that bore his name, Stanley Cross and Associates Solicitors. To me, he was an asshole. He was self-confident and dismissive towards me. I didn't like him right away. Several times when I stopped by Tracy's office to invite her to lunch, Cross seemed possessive of her and was reluctant to let her leave the office. I observed any romantic interaction between Tracy and her boss. If there was one, I didn't notice it at the time. The shit hit the fan just as the twins were finishing up their year of kindergarten. After their last day, Tyler, Beth, and Emily were going to spend the weekend with my parents. I was looking forward to a nice weekend with Tracy to try to rekindle our relationship and love life. I picked up the kids from school and dropped them off at my parents' house before returning home for what I had planned to be a nice dinner and a movie alone with Tracy. Tracy was coming down the stairs when I entered the kitchen. She wore a short black cocktail dress with a plunging neckline that showed off her large breasts. She was wearing black high heels. Her hair was loose around her shoulders, curled to perfection. She made up for a night out on the town. She looked extremely sexy. Wow, baby, you look sexy. 
If you had told me that we were going out, I would have rushed home faster. Give me a few minutes to wash up and change, and I'll be ready to leave. Where are we going? A grin appeared on Tracy's face that didn't suit her. We, she, emphasized, we, don't go out anywhere. However, I, she emphasized the I, am going out, but not with you. I was shocked. What? What do you want to say? I have a date with my boss, Stanley Cross, and this is just the beginning. From today, we will have new rules. Stan is coming to pick me up for a night on the town. I won't be home tonight or Saturday night. We have a luxury room in the city center. I'll be back sometime on Sunday afternoon. What the hell are you talking about? I yelled. You need to calm down and accept this. This is exactly how it will be. I'm leaving and will be home on Sunday afternoon. Bullshit! If you think I'm going to put up with this, you're crazy. If you walk out that door, don't plan on coming back. No, Blake, I'll go home to our house. We will remain husband and wife, and I will still live here, just like you. You have to understand that I still love you, but I need a little more. If you insist on making this difficult, then you will be the one who won't live here anymore. It would be a shame for the father of our children to be penniless and in prison. Now you need to sit next to me and let me tell you about the changes that have taken place that you will have to adapt to. I want to do this the easy way before Stan gets here in about 30 minutes. If he has to explain something to you, you will like it even less. I answered, if this asshole is here in 30 minutes, he's going to get his ass kicked in 31 minutes. You can't do this, Blake, Tracy answered confidently. For two reasons. First, you really need to listen to what he has to say about what he can do to you if you don't cooperate. And second, Max will be with him. Max is his driver and bodyguard. He's big and mean and has no sense of humor. If you touch Stan, you'll end up in the hospital. I suddenly had a feeling I hadn't had since I was a Marine in the Middle East. At first, I didn't recognize him, but then it dawned on me. I had been ambushed. On the one hand, my wife, and on the other, Stanley Cross will appear soon. I'll be in their crossfire. They seem to have the advantage of pre-planning and surprise, and I don't know how to protect myself yet. I pushed Tracy out of the way and started up the stairs. Where are you going? Tracy asked anxiously. We need to talk. I'm going to wash up and change clothes. I'll be down in five minutes. As a Marine in the Middle East, I was ambushed three times. I set a few rules for myself regarding ambushes. First, try to see it before you fall into the trap. In today's case of Tracy and Stanley Cross, I didn't see this coming. Second rule, hide immediately. That's exactly what I did as I walked out of the living room and into the temporary safety of my bedroom. The third rule was, come up with a plan to get yourself and your people out. I needed a plan. I quickly came up with one. First, I changed from my suit to casual pants and a sporty pullover shirt with a chest pocket. Then I set my iPhone to record and tucked it into my chest pocket. Then I walked to my dressing room and knelt down where my boots lay on an old chest. Stenciled across the top was Captain B.C. Ramsey, United States Marine Corps. I swept all the shoes off the top of the footlocker and felt for the key I had taped to the back. I opened the chest and immediately memories of my years of service came flooding back to me when I saw my old uniform. A fleeting thought reminded me that I knew I could still fit my entire uniform comfortably, even after putting it away for storage. Under the uniform there were several folders with documents, and under them, a box with my medals, awards for two terms of combat duty in the Middle East. I opened the box briefly, but I was there for something else. Beneath the box of medals was the prize I was looking for, Betsy, my Marine Corps 9mm Beretta. My gun came in a plastic box with a fabric lining and two clips of nine bullets each. Officially, I was not allowed to keep it, but an accident in the quartermaster system when I was discharged allowed me to do so. This particular gun had special meaning to me. He saved my life several times in battle. As I inserted the clip into the pen, I heard Tracy at the bottom of the stairs shout, Get your ass over here, Blake, or you'll be sorry, I answered. I'll come down now. 
Bring me a beer. I tucked the gun into my belt mid-back and pulled a knit shirt over it. If you weren't looking for it, it would go unnoticed. As I was leaving the bedroom, I pulled my cell phone out of my shirt pocket, turned it on to record, then put it back in my pocket, and the camera lens just showed up over the edge of the pocket. I wanted to know exactly what was on Tracy's mind and what plans she and this idiot had for me. I decided to apply some of the interrogation techniques I learned in the Marines as part of my training. I was going to be as non-confrontational as possible and encourage her to speak up and explain how she perceived the situation. When I got to the living room, I found Tracy sitting at the dining table with a glass of white wine in front of her and a cold beer for me. It's time, she warned me. We need to get some things out of the way before Stan gets here. It looks like you have something to say, Tracy, I said. Tell me about this new reality that I must accept. First of all, I want you to remember that I love you more than anything in the world, and I have a family with you, and I want to grow old and die in your arms. I really don't want to hurt your feelings, honey, she began, before I interrupted her. No more terms of endearment, Tracy. I'm not expensive or cute. Just call me Blake and I'll call you Tracy. Tracy seemed offended by my lack of affection, but she continued. Again, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but circumstances have changed since tonight. And you have to accept the change. Otherwise, you should know that Stan and I have become very close since he made me his personal assistant. Yes, I mean sex. We've been dating for almost seven months now. He started flirting with me shortly after I returned to my job as a secretary. Then we introduced the custom of drinking coffee together during breaks. When he made me his executive secretary, we spent a lot more time together, and his flirting became more like seduction. It was easy to understand what he wanted, and I was flattered that such a powerful and important person was interested in me. One day after work, when I was in his office, he made his move. His charisma, combined with his physical attractiveness and well-built body, were too much for me. I liked it so much that I immediately realized that I was not going to give it up. Apparently, you haven't thought twice about being an adulteress or cuckolding me, I said. Tracy replied, Sorry, Blake, but that's just how it is. But that doesn't mean I don't love you. You are still the man I want to spend the rest of my life with. I took a sip of beer and said, Good luck with that. Tell me, Tracy, I continued, Why? After seven months of successfully deceiving and lying to me, have you now decided to open up? Apparently, you could continue like this for many years, even without my knowledge. Until then, Blake, we both decided we were tired of it. We wanted to be open enough to enjoy our relationship to the fullest. This meant that we wanted to sleep together all night, go out in public and travel together as lovers. The only way to do this is to introduce you to the lifestyle we want. I took another sip of beer and said, Again, good luck making that happen. No, no, Blake. Tracy leaned forward and tried to take my hands in hers. There will be no divorce. We're going to stay married. You just have to accept the fact that Stan and I will be seeing each other a lot from now on. I will sleep over at his place at least one or two nights a week. Sometimes we'll go on weekend vacations together, and sometimes I might go on a long vacation with him, to Europe or the Caribbean or something. Plus, as his secretary, I will be able to travel with Stan for work and meet many important people. I will attend all his business meetings and be his companion at social events, such as dinners at the homes of his influential friends. At this time, you will have to wait for me and look after the children. Stan will increase my salary. It will be good for us. Think about the benefits. Think about all the things we can afford vacation, college education for our children. We can finally renovate the lake cabin like we've always wanted. I answered, Do you think I would want any of these things to be paid for with money earned by a prostitute from Stanley's company? I am not like that, Tracy answered angrily. I am a valuable asset to the company. I am the confidant Stan needs when he runs his law firm. Sex is part of the business of a powerful, influential man. I am proud that such a great man allowed me to become his mistress, and you should be proud too. Plus, this relationship probably won't last forever. I'm guessing it will last two years or three at the most. 
Then everything will be the same as before. I will be your faithful wife again, and we will enjoy our wonderful family together for the next fifty years. Besides, you should know that Stan wants to be your friend. He believes that I can be shared as long as he gets what he wants from the agreement and you meet his demands. He knows I love you and I will still want you to make love to me. Stan even said you could have sex with me sometimes. There will just be some conditions. Since he will be visiting us here in our home from time to time, he really wants to become a friend of the family, maybe even be considered an attentive uncle to our children. I was inwardly furious, but maintained my relatively calm demeanor. I stated adamantly, This bastard will never see or talk to my children, never. Do you understand me clearly? And then it dawned on me and I had to ask, why does this asshole want to be around my family? Doesn't he have his own family? Tracy replied. Stan is married to a beautiful young lady who is almost 20 years younger than him. She comes from a very noble family. In many ways, it was a marriage of convenience, but unfortunately, she is infertile and cannot have children. Maybe this asshole should adopt someone and stay away from other people's marriages, I said. Stan really wants to have his own children, at least one. He wants to have a blood heir to whom he will someday pass on his legal practice. He would prefer a son, but a daughter would also be acceptable. Ideally, he would like to have both. Then why doesn't this idiot use a surrogate? Then he could have as many children as he wanted, I reasoned. He talked to me about it. He told me he really wanted to be the father of a child or children, but he would make a terrible dad. He wants any of his children to grow up in a loving family environment. Tracy lowered her head as she spoke. Oh God, I can't wait to hear that, I said, getting even angrier because I was amazed at what Tracy was saying. Then I realized what Tracy was talking about. He wants to impregnate you, doesn't he? And then he wants me to become a daddy for his illegitimate child. It wouldn't be an illegitimate child, Tracy said categorically. I would be with my child and I would love it, and so would you, because you love me. And the child would have the last name Cross. Stan would pay us a lot of money to raise his child, and he would cover all the expenses until his son or daughter graduated from college. Oh my gosh, are you pregnant already? I asked. No, she replied, but he wants me to stop taking the pills in a few months. I told him I wanted you to be aware of the new relationship before we did it. This is getting worse and worse, I told myself, and again I repeated in no uncertain terms. Good luck making that happen. Tracy was angry. Stop talking like that, she demanded. I know you don't take it well right now, Blake, but as time passes we hope you'll change your mind. I was taken aback by her comments. Just as I stood up to face her, the doorbell rang. Tracy ran to the door, letting her boss in. Crossing the threshold, he grabbed her with one arm around the waist. This is getting worse and worse, I told myself again. How did he take it? Cross asked Tracy. Not very good. I think you need to explain the consequences of non-compliance, she said. I heard him answer, Then we'll move on to plan B. Shock and awe. Stan was an impressive man. I was 5 to Lebanon. He was a few inches taller and a little chubby. I wondered why Tracy was so taken with his physique. I believe his long, wavy, graying hair gave him the appearance of a distinguished man. He looked confident in his black three-piece suit and had an air of authority. His appearance and sharp voice suited the courtroom well. He came right up to me, even entered my personal space. Mr. Ramsey, I think we need to talk. Should I talk? I need to kick your ass. You could try, and by the look of you, I could get a couple of good hits in before my driver comes in here and kicks your ass. You'll be in jail by evening, so sit down. I looked out the door and saw a large man standing on my doorstep. I wasn't scared, but I wanted to hear what he had to say, so I muttered something and sat down. Okay, now we can talk like civilized people. When your wife agreed to become my personal assistant, she took on other responsibilities. Yes, I'm talking about sex. I've been enjoying your wife for the past six months, but we're tired of hiding. The two of you will be in a new relationship. As my personal assistant, she will provide me with professional and personal services as needed. Mr. Ramsey, 
you will still be Tracy's husband. Your role as a husband and father will not change, with one exception. I will take care of Tracy's sexual needs. Most of the time, these needs will be taken care of at the hotel or office, but sometimes when you are not home, we will have to use your bed. You bastard! Why do you think I'll put up with this? I'll divorce her cheating ass before I put up with all this crap. Mr. Ramsey, such conversations are unproductive. Don't forget what I do. I am a top lawyer with the credentials of the largest law firm in this city. If you try to divorce her, you will be punished. I don't just mean divorce. Of course, in a divorce, we will take everything from you and force you to pay her alimony and child support while she continues to sleep with me. Your wonderful little son and twin daughters that you cherish so much. You won't see them very often, if at all. You see, you'll be charged with child molestation. You will go to jail for a long time and never see your children again. I'm sure your company will fire you right away. Plus, your family and friends will disown you. I sat stunned, not knowing what to say. I had no idea that Tracy and this idiot were willing to go to such lengths to promote their open connections. Stan continued, Don't do anything stupid. If you try to tell my wife, all the hell I just explained to you will fall on your head, plus a visit from my driver and his friends, after which you will probably not be able to walk, much less lie, with a woman. If you try to just leave town, my private investigators will track you down, so be a good boy and just accept this new relationship. Your wife is a wonderful helper. I turned to Tracy and asked, would you really do this to me? She answered, I wouldn't want to, Blake, and I won't have to as long as you play by our rules. After a while, you will see that this will become the new normal and you will not resist it. Still stunned, I watched as my wife and this idiot walked towards the door. He grabbed her bag and was almost out the door when I interrupted them. Before you go, asshole, I have a few things you should know. Annoyed and rolling his eyes in silent contempt, the asshole said, What's the matter and hurry up? I began, after I've had a couple of stiff drinks and celebrated the death of my marriage, I'm going to call your wife and tell her everything you don't want her to hear. Then I turned to Tracy. Next, I'm going to call your sister Lucy and tell her the same thing. I'll let her tell your parents. Stan wasn't sure he heard me correctly, because it went against everything he was used to when trying to commit extortion. What you said? He asked, menacingly. Without repeating myself, I continued. Early Saturday morning, I'm going to call a locksmith and change all the locks. Now Tracy listened in amazement and tried to understand what was happening. After the locks are changed, I'm going to walk a block to Kate's house and invite her over for dinner, dancing, and drinks. I never told you, but she flirted shamelessly with me, starting just a few months after her husband died. She may be a little older than me and doesn't have the movie star face like you, but she has the body of a goddess. She even modeled one of her bikinis for me. Just an hour ago, I wouldn't have thought about leaving you, Tracy. But things have changed, haven't they? Tracy put on an offended expression and muttered, stuttering. Blake, you... you can't do this. I continued. When you two come back on Sunday afternoon... You'll find all of Tracy's things in the middle of the front yard. This includes everything she owns. All her clothes, shoes, personal items, makeup, jewelry, and even our wedding album. And they will be in plastic garbage bags. You should probably make arrangements to pick them up before Monday morning at 4 a.m. because that's when the automatic sprinklers come on. Now Stan was starting to seethe. He blushed and clenched his fists because he couldn't believe that all the threats he made to me were useless. A pained expression appeared on Tracy's face, and lastly, I was ready to finish my joke. I'm going to make an appointment with a divorce lawyer on Monday morning. Not only will I file for divorce for adultery, but I will also name you Stanley as a co-defendant. In addition, I am going to file a lawsuit against you for alienation of affection and another lawsuit against your firm for violating your company's fraternization policy. I'm guessing a big company like yours has one, and even if these two lawsuits are dismissed as is likely, they will publicly embarrass you and your firm and humiliate you in the eyes of your peers. This asshole was furious. He threw the bag with his things against the wall and walked towards me, again invading my personal space. 
he poked me hard in the chest with two fingers. It took all my self-control not to respond in kind. Listen, cuckold, he began. You obviously have no idea who you're dealing with or how ruthless I can be with someone I want to crush. I'm Stanley Cross. I run the largest law firm in the area. I can legally gut you in one day. By the time Tracy and I get to our hotel, you'll be arrested on any number of charges. You think that if you are innocent, you can fight me. You cannot. I have been practicing law in this state for 30 years. I know most of the senior police officials personally, and I am friends with many of the attorneys in the DA's office. In fact, I even slept with a few of them. Most judges in this city are either indebted to me or know that I have dirt on them. Even the politicians are on my side because I have often helped them get elected one way or another. Stanley was on a roll, and I didn't want to stop him. If you go out tomorrow night with your friend Kate, the police will stop you and they will find a reason to search your car. There is a high probability that they will find some illegal substances. The morality department will receive information that you have prohibited children's videos on your computer. And this is just the beginning. How long and how much will it cost you to fight these charges? You won't be able to find a lawyer anywhere who would be willing to speak out against me. You'll never get your life back. In the meantime, I will still have your wife. Do you understand, Kukold? I completely believe everything you say, asshole. Stanley turned to me again. You need to show me a little more respect, Kukold. You must call me Sir or Mr. Cross. If you call me an asshole again, I'll ask Max to teach you some manners. When Cross said this, he punched me twice with his right hand to get his point across about omnipotence. The second time he did this, I broke all his fingers. Cross couldn't believe it. For a split second, he was completely surprised and looked at his hand in disbelief. Tracy, horrified by what was happening, rushed to his aid. You fucking son of a bitch, you will pay for this. I'm going to kill you. Remembering that his bodyguard was standing right behind the closed front door, he shouted, Max, come here quickly. The front door immediately opened and Max walked in. He was big. He looked like a villain from some 1940s film noir who didn't know his own power. Yes, Mr. Cross, he said. Cross pointed at me with his good hand and said, Take care of him, Max. Yes, Mr. Cross, Max answered and walked across the living room towards me. Tracy tried to object, but Cross waved her off. I had anticipated this kind of confrontation when Tracy first mentioned that Cross would have his bodyguard with him, and I knew that I could get some kind of insult from him. However, it had to be bad. I recalled my experiences as a prisoner of war during the war in Afghanistan, where I was mistreated and tortured by my captors. However, these trials strengthened my character and taught me to endure pain. Max and Cross physically abused me in my own home. I was forced to defend myself by wounding Max with a firearm. I warned Max against further hostile actions, making it clear that I was ready to take extreme measures. I then subdued Cross, using my weapon as intimidation. I made Cross call his wife to demonstrate to her the situation and my determination to act firmly if anyone tried to harm me or my family again. Thus, despite the use of force, I sought to avoid unnecessary bloodshed, but at the same time I was determined to protect myself and my loved ones from any attack. Look, Mrs. Cross, I don't have much time. You should know that my wife and your husband have been having an affair with each other for the last six or seven months. Today, they told me that they are going to go to a hotel for the weekend. When I objected to this, your husband forced Max to work on me. My husband is supposed to be at our desert home in Palm Springs this weekend, working on a case he has to present in court next week. He lied to you, Mrs. Cross. He's right here on the floor of my house right now. Oh, and this is my wife, Tracy. I turned the phone so that Mrs. Cross could see my wife kneeling in the back of the room, her hands to her cheeks, in tears, and with a scared look on her face. As you can see, Mrs. Cross, my wife is wearing a very sexy dress and is ready to spend a night on the town with your husband before they head to the hotel he has booked for tonight and Saturday evening. Mrs. Cross replied, I can't believe this is happening. I was surprised too, I quipped. I finished. I have to hang up, Mrs. Cross. The police will be here soon. It was nice talking to you. 
I threw the cell phone on the floor and turned my attention back to Cross. Well, asshole, it looks like your wife is now aware of your extracurricular activities. So what are you going to do now that I've told her everything? Oh yeah, you're going to invite Max and a few of his friends to visit me, after which I'll be crippled and emasculated. Looking at Max, I said, Max probably won't be able to work for some time. Cross nodded his head affirmatively. I looked at Tracy. Bring me my briefcase, and don't forget to clean up your lover's shit from my carpet later. Nervously, Tracy took my briefcase from where I left it when I first came home. When she placed it next to me, I opened it and took out my laptop. Is this the computer you were planning to load with illegal videos, idiot? He glanced at the computer but said nothing. I turned the laptop around to see the bottom of it and found the hard drive. Then I laid him down and put two bullets into him. The shot from my pistol again startled everyone present, and again the smell of gun smoke filled the room. I leaned towards his right ear and said, Try loading this computer with something now. I then ordered Tracy to fetch a wet towel from the kitchen and help stop the bleeding from Max's shoulder. She hurried to the kitchen and returned a minute later to tend to Max. I then told everyone to stay in their seats while I went to the kitchen to wash my face. Once in the kitchen, I took out my cell phone. He was still recording. I saw that the battery charge was showing the last percentage of energy. I looked at my phone and said to myself, I can't let the police get this footage. If they do this, and Cross has as much influence over the police as he said, then the tape will definitely be lost. I'll have to hide my phone. I quickly opened the bottom kitchen drawer to the right of the sink and placed the phone in a pile of clean dish towels. There was little chance that he would be discovered there by accident. Finally, I soaked a kitchen towel in water and dried my face. My nose was covered in dried blood and was still bleeding. My eye was very swollen, and I could no longer see anything with it, not even shadows. And I had a headache. I wondered if I might have a concussion. I was only gone for a minute, and when I returned to the living room, everyone was still in their seats. Stay where you are until the police arrive. They should be here in a few minutes. I believe they will have an ambulance nearby. With these words, I went out onto the porch. The first thing I saw were several of my neighbors lined up on the sidewalk. One of them asked, Were those the shots we heard from you, Blake? I said, Yes, they. Did anyone call 911? Two people raised their hands. One of my neighbors was retired Marine Colonel Orson Sage. We were best friends and often drank beer together. I always called him Colonel, and he always called me Captain. Are you wounded, Captain? Asked the Colonel. You should see the other guys, I replied, laughing. In the distance, I heard sirens wail. I knew the police would be here in just a few minutes. Colonel, I said, could you do me a favor? I need help. Of course, Captain, he answered and walked from the sidewalk to the steps of my porch. First of all, could you help me unload these pistols and put them on the porch? I don't want to be seen waving one of these when the police show up. The colonel took the pistol from my hands and the one I took out of my pocket. He quickly pulled the clip out of the Betsy, removed the round from the chamber, and placed them on the porch. He then unloaded Max's revolver and placed the pistol and ammunition next to the semi-automatic. Kate, a widowed neighbor from across the street, saw that I had been badly beaten and came over with the intention of helping me. While they were both there, I turned to the colonel and said, I wish I had time to explain everything to you, but I don't. You should know that I had a fight with my wife's boyfriend. He is a powerful lawyer and threatened to load my car with illegal substances and then let the cops arrest me. I gave the colonel my keys. If you could, after this circus is over sometime late at night and if they don't tape off the crime scene around the garage, take my car and hide it for me. The code on the garage door matches my address number. It will be done, Captain, he replied. Kate intervened in the conversation. You look bad, Blake. I'm starting to get sick and dizzy, I answered. Maybe I was hit harder than I thought. Kate helped me sit on the porch steps, just as two police cars pulled up with red and blue lights flashing and sirens wailing. They made their way through the neighbors, who were mostly standing on the sidewalk and on the other side of the street. They approached the house with their hands on their pistols. 
The colonel assured them that there was no danger and pointed to the unloaded pistols on the porch. They asked if anyone was inside, and I said yes. There were three people there, and one of them was injured and needed medical attention. One policeman looked at me and said, Looks like you need medical attention, too. At this time, two ambulances arrived at the scene. They also had lights flashing and sirens blaring. Immediately, two or three emergency medical technicians jumped out of their cars, crossed the yard, and climbed onto the porch. One of the police officers who was in the house came out to meet them and said that there was a man in the living room with two gunshot wounds. The orderlies disappeared into the house to do their job. Meanwhile, my head began to spin more and more. Kate told me to lie down. One of the ambulance workers hovered over me and began to peer into my face. I told him that I thought my right forearm was broken. Sometime later, I was semi-conscious when the paramedics wheeled Max out on a stretcher. I vaguely remember seeing Cross being helped to the ambulance with his coat wrapped around his waist. Tracy was then escorted out of the house and led to a police car by a female officer. She suddenly stopped when she saw me lying on the porch with two doctors examining me. She cried. I think the sight of my face made her stop and move away from her escort. Blake, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. This is not what I wanted, she wailed. I didn't want you to get hurt. She tried to lean in to touch me, but I raised my good hand and pushed her away. Go to hell, eat shit and die, that's all I said. Her escort then grabbed her and dragged her to a police car. I don't know if I lost consciousness or if the doctor gave me something to ease the pain. Whatever it was, I was gone for three days. When I first woke up, my vision was blurry, but I was looking into the eyes of an angel in white. As my vision cleared a little, I noticed that she was actually a 60-year-old angel, but she was still beautiful. Mr. Blake, can you hear me? She asked. I'm so happy that you are with us again. I'm probably in the hospital, I said. Yes, she answered. You are at Mercy General Hospital in Midtown. You've slept for three days. Three days, I exclaimed, when I became a little more aware of my surroundings. Yes, so long. I'll go get the doctor. He will explain everything to you. Just relax. By the way, my name is Rose. While I was alone in the room, I began to evaluate myself. My right forearm was in a cast. With my good hand, I felt my face. I had gauze and a bandage on my left eye, and my nose was also bandaged. Touching my eye or nose was painful. Other than the head and arm injuries, I seemed fine. However, I was connected to several medical devices that beeped regularly. One machine gave me a saline drip. Looking under the blanket, I noticed that I was connected to a catheter. Finally, I had a blood pressure sleeve on my arm that inflated and deflated regularly. When I finished my examination, Rose reappeared with the doctor, who introduced himself as Dr. York. The shortened version of his description of my condition was that I had a simple fracture to my right forearm, a broken nose that probably wouldn't be too disfiguring, and my eye was black-blue and swollen. All will heal. He kept me under anesthesia for three days because he thought I had a mild concussion and wanted my brain to rest. Since I woke up late at night, he decided to give me something that would make me sleep until the morning. A few minutes later, I fell asleep. When I woke up in the morning, a surprise awaited me. My left wrist was handcuffed to the bed rail. What a devil! I exclaimed when I realized what it was. Relax, Mr. Ramsey, said the voice. Looking around the room, I saw a middle-aged man in a suit with an untied tie. They told me that you will wake up now, he said. What's happening? Why am I handcuffed to a hospital bed? I don't think it was because you were afraid that I would fall out of bed. I'm Detective Sergeant Hardman, said the man. And no, Mr. Ramsey, we weren't worried about you falling out of bed. We were worried that you might run away. Run away? Looks like I'm in shape to run somewhere. And why should I even run away? You are handcuffed because you are under arrest. What? I exclaimed again. Yes, you are under arrest for assault with intent to murder. Assault with a deadly weapon. Assault with intent to cause great bodily harm. Spousal abuse. And several lesser charges such as unlawful use of a firearm. Later today... After you have been examined by a doctor, 
you will be moved to a secure room on the third floor. At this time, your handcuffs will be removed. And where did all these accusations come from? I demanded an answer. The original complaint was filed by Mr. Stanley Cross on behalf of himself, Mr. Max Angel, and your wife, Tracy Ramsey. I should have guessed, I told myself. Before we continue, said the detective, I must read you your rights. The detective obediently read me my rights and left the room. A few minutes later, Rose came into my room. She was silent while she collected my statistics. Did you know about this, Rose? I asked raised my hand and rattled the handcuffs. Yes, Mr. Ramsey, she replied. I am so sorry. None of this is true, Rose. Trust me, and I'll invite you to dinner when this is all over. I believe you. This better be a five-star restaurant, she joked. A few hours later, Dr. York came to see me. Basically, he said that I would get better with time. He then told me that I would soon be moved to another ward and would have a different doctor. Shortly thereafter, Detective Hardman returned with several orderlies. I was wheeled up to the third floor, past a uniformed policeman standing guard at the guarded entrance, and into a small, private room. The handcuffs were removed as unnecessary, since the room had a lock on the outside of the door, and I was again connected to the hospital machines. Before I left, the detective told me that in a few days, when I felt better, I would be charged over a closed channel telecommunications, where I can declare my innocence. He asked me if I had a lawyer, and I said no. He said he would send a representative from the public defender's office for an initial interview, and I could decide what I wanted to do after that. In my free time, when I needed to think, I thought about how quickly my life took this turn. I mourned the loss of my wife and cried at night over the instant dissolution of my marriage. Then my thoughts turned to my children. Where were they? What are they being told? Who cares about them? I also wanted to know what the status of my job was. I was gone for four days without telling anyone. The doctors, nurses, and orderlies in the ward were unable to answer any of my questions. On the fifth day of my stay in the hospital, the public defender visited me. It was a young lawyer named Sam Wilton. He was familiar with my case as he understood it and had a lot of information for me. First of all, he announced the list of charges brought against me. In fact, these were the same ones that the detective described. I found it helpful to have a copy of the charges in writing. He then told me that I was to be arraigned at 10 a.m. the next day. He wanted to know how I wanted to act. Before I could respond, he told me that if I agreed to plead guilty to most of the lesser charges, he might be able to make a deal with the DA's office. I interrupted him mid-sentence to say that I was not guilty of any of the charges. I asked about my children. Apparently, after my wife gave a statement to the police, she was released. Her sister Lucy took her in, and she stayed with my sister-in-law and her husband until yesterday when investigators cleared our home for occupancy. My children were not told anything about me except that I was going to leave my family for a long time. Regarding my work, I gave Sam my company's contact information and asked him to explain to my boss what happened. As I reread the charges against me, I noted some of the things the detective told me that didn't make the right impression on me. What kind of spousal abuse charge is this? I asked. Sam told me that Stanley Cross added this to his complaint after Tracy claimed that I hit her several times. In fact, Sam had photographs of all the injuries each person had received. Among them were several photographs of Tracy's face with prominent black and blue bruises on her left cheek and a purple bruise on her upper left forearm. I didn't do this to her, I said. I never touched her. Looking at Sam's face, I noticed that he had an expression that said he didn't believe me. At this point, I decided that I was not going to give him any explanation for what really happened. In fact, I didn't know whether Cross's influence extended to the public defender's office. I didn't want to risk that being the case. Sam shared his opinion about my case. He said I had three witnesses who were going to swear to their version of events. The evidence seemed to prove them right. He hinted to me that he might be able to convince the DA to accept a plea deal if I admitted two or three lesser charges at arraignment. He said the DA would be happy to finish my case without expending much energy. But, he added, all three witnesses would still have filed civil charges against me if I had pleaded guilty. 
To be convicted of what I was accused of was unthinkable for me. If I am convicted of most of the charges in civil court, I could be screwed financially. There is no way I would consider a guilty plea or a play bargain. Sam, I said, you must find me not guilty at my arraignment. Okay, Mr. Ramsey, he replied, but you should know that it will be a hell of a job to get bail for you after you are accused of shooting someone. Although you haven't admitted it, the evidence the DA has so far could quite easily prove you are the shooter. I appreciate everything you try to do for me, Sam. Judging by your tone, I would guess that you consider me most likely guilty. However, it is not. At this point, I did not mention to Sam that I had videotape that would prove that I was guilty of self-defense only. I didn't want the fact that I had any evidence at all to come back to the DA or, more specifically, Stanley Cross. Instead, I told Sam that I needed him to contact my lawyer. I didn't actually have a lawyer. I had an uncle who served in the Navy Advocate Corps his entire career and is now retired. He rose from defense attorney as a junior officer to prosecutor to judge in the office of the Attorney General of the United States Navy. After retiring as a captain, he moved to the San Francisco area, took the California bar exam, and then went to work in a family practice law office. After he retired again, he used his experience and knowledge as a volunteer advocate for children in the court system. My uncle's name was Jonathan Allen Carter, but everyone used his initials, J-A-C, and called him Jack, or Uncle Jack in my case, since I didn't have Uncle Jack's contact information available. I gave his name and everything I could remember to Sam and told Sam to look him up. Sam shouldn't have told anyone about my attempt to contact Uncle Jack. All he could do was tell Uncle Jack that I was in serious legal trouble, give him a list of the charges against me, and tell him that I said I was innocent and that I needed his help. Sam called me late in the evening. He said that my uncle will be with me the day after tomorrow. He also told me that Uncle Jack told me not to talk to anyone about my business. When I was charged, all I had to say was, not guilty. The next day, I was arraigned in a courtroom televised from the hospital. Apparently, a lot of people have been charged in cases like this because there was a screen in the hospital room that was designed for this kind of thing. As expected, the charges were read out, and I was asked how I felt about each charge, to which I replied, not guilty. The prosecutor demanded that I be detained without the possibility of bail because I was dangerous and violent. The judge stated that according to my doctors, I should remain in the hospital for two more days and then be transferred to the county jail to await a hearing. At the hearing, the judge had to decide whether I should be judged or not. The day before I was to be transferred to the county jail, my Uncle Jack showed up. He completed the paperwork to officially represent me and received permission to visit me in the hospital. Never in my life have I been so glad to see a friendly face. I hugged him and cried a little. Until that moment, I didn't realize what I was going through. After a brief reunion, Uncle Jack got down to business. First, he asked for a private room where he could talk privately. He then touched on some home economics topics that he t thought I should know. He spoke briefly to Lucy. He knew her like a member of the family. Most importantly, he told me that my children were okay. Tracy and my children stayed with Lucy and her family for a while, at least until the police cleared the house for occupancy. Lucy was confused. Tracy told Lucy her version of what had happened and listed the charges against me. But Lucy had known me all my married life and had a hard time believing anything they said about me. She was happy that Uncle Jack was here to help me. Then Uncle Jack wanted to know what exactly happened to get me to where I was. In a whispered conversation, I told Uncle Jack what really happened. He shook his head and told me it was an incredible story. I went on to tell him that, at some point, sometime after I was arrested, Stanley Cross, Max Engel, and my wife conspired to come up with an alternate version of what happened the night it all happened. In an even more animated, whispered conversation, I told Uncle Jack that I had a video of everything that happened on my iPhone. He showed no emotion, but I think he was relieved to know that there might be hard evidence to support my story.
The only downside to this revelation was that my phone was hidden in a drawer in the kitchen of my house. Uncle Jack assured me that he would be my guardian angel throughout the entire ordeal. He told me that my only job now is to get better. In the meantime, he was going to review the case against me in detail and develop a strategy for my defense. He was also going to see if he could arrange bail for me. I had to sit quietly for a few days, and he would come back to me. I asked him to ask about my children, if possible. He assured me that he seemed to have a good relationship with Lucy and would work through her in this regard. I was discharged from the city hospital and transferred to the city prison. I haven't heard from Uncle Jack for three days. Finally, I was taken to the judge. Uncle Jack was there. Apparently, Uncle Jack convinced the judge that I deserved bail. However, I must be under house arrest. During his absence, Uncle Jack rented a townhouse in a gated community. This was to be my new place of residence. Uncle Jack also stayed there. I couldn't leave the small area of the gated community. Uncle Jack had a few tricks up his sleeve. He didn't tell me what it was, at least not until they somehow worked. He hired a private detective agency to help him and had them work on several leads. The big problem was getting my cell phone out of its hiding place in the kitchen drawer. I was sure I couldn't do this as I had a restraining order requiring me to stay away from my home, my wife, and my children. Uncle Jack would never think of breaking into a house to take a phone. He knew that he would find a way sooner or later, but the opportunity had not yet presented itself. Meanwhile, Uncle Jack set up a new cell phone account for himself and me, so at least I had someone to call if needed. One person I called was my neighbor, a colonel. I told him about my status and position. He said there were some things going on in the house that I might like to know about. When I told Uncle Jack about this, he asked me to invite the colonel over for a couple of beers and some steaks on the grill. The colonel told us that one night, about a week after the incident and before the house was returned to Tracy, he heard his German shepherd, Semper, barking at something outside. From his front window, he looked across the street into my driveway and noticed two men in dark clothing surreptitiously shining a flashlight on the front garage door. He called 911 to report a possible break-in. He then quickly got dressed and, with the dog by his side and an aluminum bat in his hand, crossed the street to confront the intruders. The intruders did not see or hear him approach before he stood behind them, and they tried to pick the garage door lock. You chose the wrong area to rob, he said. When the robbers turned around, the colonel took their photograph. They were wearing hoods, which would prove to any potential skeptics that they were, in fact, intruders. The would-be bandits jumped back at first, but immediately realized that the colonel was alone. You better get out of here, old man, one of them said and took a threatening step towards him. The colonel's shepherd dog was not easy to see in the darkness, but the bandits heard its threatening growl as it stood between the colonel and the bad guys and bared its teeth. In addition, the colonel raised his bat and stood in the position of a batter preparing to hit the pitched ball. The second of the two thieves said, Let's get out of here. They then retreated down the driveway and into a black SUV parked a few houses down the block. The colonel followed them outside and watched them drive away. He noted that the license plate was hidden. A few minutes later, a police car arrived and the colonel was already waiting for them. They noticed there was crime scene tape on the doors of the house. He gave the officers a brief description of the event, and after searching the premises for half an hour, they wrote a report and left. I remembered that Cross had threatened to plant illegal substances in my car and then stop me and search me on some anonymous tip or on his instructions, because he was so influential in the police, as he claimed. Therefore, I was happy that the colonel moved my car to a safe place, unknown to my wife. As if that story wasn't enough, the colonel had another. Just two days after Tracy was allowed back into the house, the colonel noticed a black SUV park it in front of my house. As he continued to watch, he noticed two men talking to Tracy in front of the open garage door. Judging by her hand gestures, Tracy was pointing to the empty box where my car was usually parked. After several minutes of lively discussion, Tracy and her guests entered the house. The men left after about 45 minutes. 
However, they did not leave before the colonel copied the license plate of the black SUV they were driving. Uncle Jack checked the license plate through one of his sources and found out that it was registered to a company called Unique Services. After doing some more research, he found out that Unica Services was registered as a private investigation company. The only two employees at Unique Services were Jose Gonzalez and Miguel Ortega. A little more research revealed that both of them were police officers in different cities. Jose was asked to resign after being questioned about the theft of police evidence storage. Miguel was fired for falsifying arrest reports. Moreover, the law firm of Stanley Cross was listed as a client of Unique Services. It has now become a priority to retrieve my mobile phone from the kitchen of my house. Uncle Jack was going to do it. His plan was to call Tracy and ask her if he could come and talk to her directly and informally about the situation. He explained that he wanted to help me and her at the same time by dropping most of the charges and resolving a number of issues that would improve the situation for everyone involved. Tracy knew Uncle Jack because he was part of the family, and they met at many family gatherings. However, she became a little suspicious and said she would call him back. The next day she called him and they agreed to meet that evening at 6 p.m. However, she added that her lawyer insisted that one of his colleagues also attend the meeting. Uncle Jack readily agreed to this condition. Uncle Jack told me everything that happened. At exactly 6 p.m., he rang the doorbell of my house. Tracy quickly answered the phone and invited him inside. He said he was glad to see her again, and they even hugged for a minute. Tracy was dressed very modestly in a knee-length skirt and white blouse, her hair pulled back into a ponytail. Once inside, Uncle Jack noticed a young man in a suit and tie and was introduced to Gordon Merritt. He was a lawyer at the law firm of Stanley Cross. The two men shook hands. The three of them sat in the large living room, and Tracy excused herself and said she would bring them coffee. As soon as they sat down, Mr. Merritt suggested getting down to business. Before doing this, he took out a voice recorder, placed it on the coffee table, and said that he was going to record their conversation. Uncle Jack took out his recorder and placed it next to the lawyer's recorder. The two counselors smiled at each other. Uncle Jack started the conversation. I'm so sorry that things have escalated into this troubling situation for both you and Blake. You two have always been one of my favorite people, and you always seemed so loving to each other. I'm sorry too, Uncle Jack. I never wanted it to go this far. I can't believe how out of control everything has gotten, Tracy lamented. Jack continued as if he believed the allegations against me were accurate, and he was skeptical of my version of events. You probably know, Uncle Jack continued, that he claims that you and Mr. Cross had an affair, and when he saw Cross in the house, ready to take you to a business meeting, he just couldn't take it anymore and got very angry. He even claims that Mr. Cross's bodyguard started it all. At this point, Counselor Merritt intervened. We believe that the evidence, both the testimony of the participants and the physical evidence, is quite compelling against Mr. Blake. I think so too, Mr. Merritt, answered Uncle Jack. That's why I ask you, if you can, to testify that Blake may have been out of his mind at the time of the incident. Basically, he snapped for a moment because he was convinced that Mr. Cross was taking his wife away from him. You can point out that up until this time, Blake has always been the ideal husband, father, and provider. Merritt thought for a moment and then said, We might consider something like this if Mr. Ramsey pleads guilty to the charges against him. Uncle Jack replied, You mean all the charges? Or is there a way to have some charges dropped or mitigated? I will have to consult Mr. Cross about this. He is very influential in the prosecutor's office. We may be able to get back to you with an alternative solution that resolves this issue. After all, it would not only be better for Mr. Ramsey, but also for Mr. Cross, who also doesn't like being at the center of a highly publicized trial like this. It's bad for his reputation and bad for business. That's all I came for, Tracy. Thank you for having me. Blake wants you to tell the kids that he misses them and that he loves them. Tracy seemed to sympathize with the thought, and her eyes missed it over. Before Uncle Jack turned off his recorder, he added one more thought. I hope you understand, Tracy, that
that if I can prove that Blake's story is true, you will be prosecuted for perjury, obstruction of justice, and several other similar crimes, all of which carry prison sentences. Gordon Merritt was about to say something when Uncle Jack addressed him. And you, lawyer, if I can prove that you knew that your client and Mr. Cross were lying, you will also be prosecuted. Before you respond, I would like the two of you to discuss what I said between you. With these words, Uncle Jack took his recorder and stood up. While you're talking, would you mind if I pour myself some water? No, no, of course not, Uncle Jack. The kitchen is over there, and Tracy pointed to the door next to the dining room. If you want, there is ice water in the refrigerator. Uncle Jack headed to the kitchen. Once there, he made sure that he was not visible from the living room. He opened the refrigerator noisily and then quickly walked to the bottom right drawer by the sink. He reached into the pile of folded dish towels in the back of the drawer and felt my iPhone. He quickly put it in his pocket, went back to the refrigerator, found ice water, and poured himself a drink. About two minutes later, Uncle Jack returned to the living room. Before I go, Tracy, is there anything you want to tell me at all? Tracy glanced nervously at Gordon Merritt. Merritt spoke for her. We have nothing more to say at this time, Mr. Carter. We'll let you know what we come up with to change the charges against Mr. Ramsey, and we will expect you to be obedient if you want this action to stop. Uncle Jack concluded, I can't ask for more than that. Thanks for meeting with me, Tracy. See you in court, Mr. Merritt. Uncle Jack didn't bring the iPhone into the townhouse. He agreed with a company called Digital Analysis Solutions to analyze the contents of the phone. Uncle Jack briefed the DAS director on the background of the case and the importance of the video-audio recording to my defense. The DAS staff assured Uncle Jack that they understood the situation and would take good care of it. They'll call Uncle Jack in a few days with their analysis. A few days later, Uncle Jack and I were invited to the DA's office to be informed of their findings. Das transferred everything on my phone to their own server. They actually discovered the video in question and made several copies of it. In fact, they made about a dozen copies and stored the files on DVDs, flash drives, and the cloud. There is no way the video could have been lost, stolen, or destroyed. You don't need to worry, Uncle Jack. She is poison to me. Uncle Jack added, You know what you need to do, right? Yes, Uncle Jack, I know, I answered. After finishing the conversation with my Uncle Jake, I called the security post and asked them to let her through. In the few minutes I had before she knocked on the door, I cleaned up the townhouse. There were a lot of legal papers and notes on the dining room table, which I threw on the bed. I threw out the beer cans and cleaned up the kitchen, throwing everything in the dishwasher. Finally, I changed into trousers and a knitted sports shirt and combed my hair. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to shave, and I had three days of stubble on my face. I thought it made me look tough. As soon as Tracy knocked on the door, I opened it. My first impression was that she looked great. She had put a lot of effort into dressing for this meeting. She was wearing a red pleated knee-length skirt and a pink cashmere sweater that was not buttoned all the way. Her hair was in a sort of messy style and she was wearing a small amount of makeup. Her lipstick and nails matched the color of her skirt. Come in, Tracy, I said. Nice to see you again. You look great. Thank you, Blake, she replied. You look good, too. In fact, you look very slim and beautiful. I had a lot of time to work out in the gym of the complex. With the exception of the occasional beer, I eat a lot of fruits and vegetables and I avoid sugar, processed foods, and anything deep-fried. I moved on. Please sit on the sofa, and I will bring you a glass of white wine. I behaved unctuously. I returned from the kitchen with a glass of white wine for Tracy and a glass of red wine for myself. After taking a few sips, I asked her why she wanted to see me. I know so much has happened between us, Blake, but I want you to know that I still love you just as much as ever. I never thought it would go this far. I said, I know how you wanted everything to go. You wanted me to be a cuckold and accept the lifestyle you wanted with Cross. It seemed like everything would be so simple. 
All you had to do was agree to let me play with Cross. I could have a great time and still be your loving wife. And we could make so much money. In about a year, everything would be back to normal. I would just be yours forever and ever. I'm sorry I ruined your plans, I said sarcastically. It wasn't my plans, she said. It was rather Cross's plans. He was confident that he could intimidate you into doing what he wanted. He's done this many times before, both professionally and socially. Neither he nor I expected you to take such extreme physical action. It was so unlike you. You were always so calm, easygoing, and friendly. That's probably why he thought I was a weakling, I suggested. You can't even imagine how scared I was of you when I saw how cruel you were. This was the side of my character that I tried to suppress. I've hidden it for years, ever since I was a Marine in the Middle East. This is not who I am now. Out of nowhere, Tracy asked, Where is your car? I chuckled slightly and said, I do not know exactly. When Cross said he would drop him off other illegal substances, I took it seriously and moved her to a place where he couldn't find her. Speaking of my car, what were the two men doing in the house shortly after you returned into the house? They seemed very interested in the garage and my missing car. Tracy answered reluctantly. I think they wanted to plant incriminating evidence in your car. I didn't want them to do it, but Stanley insisted that we bury you. You don't seem to mind collecting evidence against me. Your whole story is about to send me to jail for a long time. If you love me as much as you say you do, just tell the truth and the DA will drop the charges tomorrow. I can't do this, Blake. I'm in too deep. Stanley has such a commanding personality that whatever he says, it will be so. This seems unfortunate for me, I commented. Then it was my turn to ask a question. What is this charge against me for beating you? From the photographs they showed me, you had cuts and bruises on your face and arms. I never touched you, Tracy replied. It was Stanley's idea. As soon as you walked out onto the porch, his mind ran through an alternate scenario of what actually happened. He told Max and me what our story would be. The version he put forward was that he came to the house to pick me up for a business dinner. You became unreasonable and accused me and Stanley of having an affair and then hit me. When Stanley intervened, the two of you got into a fight. When Max heard the noise, he came into the house to help me and Stanley, but you shot him before he could intervene. To make the story believable, he hit me several times before I could say anything. We've gotten together a few times over the past few weeks to practice our story so there aren't any holes in it. I'm so sorry, Blake, Tracy exclaimed. I did not want this. I want you and me to be the same as we were before. Well, I said, that won't happen. There is a way out, Blake, Tracy seemed serious. Stanley has done a lot of research on you. He knows that you are a war hero. He knows that you have been subjected to war, violence, and murder. He also knows that you have been diagnosed with severe PTSD. He wants you to plead guilty based on your history of PTSD. He said he would use his influence with the DA and the court to get you sent to a VA hospital where you could get treatment. In a year or maybe less, you will be released as cured. I'd be waiting for you, Blake. We could start over with our kids and have a nice long life together. Just you, me, and the kids. So, that was the real reason why she came to talk to me. She wanted me to voluntarily confess to the crime, promising that Cross would help me get a minimum sentence in a Virginia mental hospital. I didn't believe any of it, but I didn't let Tracy know it. Instead, I played along with her. That sounds good to me, Tracy, but you'll have to let me think about it for a while. Besides, I'll need to talk to Uncle Jack. I think he could go for it, too. He seems to have so little evidence to help me compared to you, Cross, and Max. Please do this for yourself, Blake, Tracy added. Do it for yourself, me and the children. In a few years, it will seem like it never happened. It will just be a bump in the road. I doubt it, I said. You slept with another man for months. You wanted me to be a willing cuckold for your boss. You threatened to take my children away from me if I didn't play along, and you made false accusations against me that would put me in prison for many years. This is not a small bump in the road. That's why I want you to accept Stanley's offer. This is the easiest way out for all of us. Tracy's eyes were full of tears.
Like I said, I'll think about it, I added one last time. We're done. I suggested that it was time for her to leave. Tracy, however, put her hand on mine and said, Maybe we could relax together for a few minutes. I missed you in my bed. Is there a chance that we could sleep together tonight and forget about what's going on around us, even for a few hours? That won't happen, Tracy, I replied. You disgust me. It was obvious that I was adamant, and Tracy took the hint. Please accept Stanley's offer, she said. I walked her to the door. Before she left, she hugged me, but I didn't return the hug. The purpose of the hearing was to determine whether I should be detained for investigation. The prosecution was extremely confident. As you might expect, they invited Cross, Max, and Tracy to the stand where they recounted their well-rehearsed versions of events. Uncle Jack asked each witness only one question. Do you swear to the truth of your testimony? Each of the three answered yes. Uncle Jack wanted to burn Jose and Miguel, as well as three key witnesses, but trying to prove that they were accomplices in trying to frame me was not relevant to the specific charges against me. This was especially true because all their attempts to frame me failed. When the prosecution calmed down, it was time for Uncle Jack to do his thing. With the permission of the court, Uncle Jack began, the defense would like to include a video recording of the events in question as evidence. This evidence is exculpatory, Your Honor. Immediately, the assistant district attorney jumped in and stated that this new evidence had not been presented to the prosecution for review. There was a reason for this, Uncle Jack explained. The defense is concerned that the DA and the court will be biased against my client and will unfairly destroy our evidence. Do you have any evidence that the DA's office is compromised, Mr. Carter? asked the judge. The evidence is on video, Your Honor, Uncle Jack replied. You and the prosecution will retire to my chambers, where I will review the videotape and make a decision on its admissibility. The judge began to stand up when Uncle Jack spoke. No, Your Honor, we won't do that. Why not? asked the judge. He was starting to get angry that someone had disobeyed him in his court. Because, Your Honor, the defense does not believe that the court is completely impartial and we will not take any chances if you decide to suppress our evidence. Are you accusing the court of corruption, Mr. Carter? Perhaps the court is corrupt, Your Honor. Can you prove your statement, Mr. Carter? Or is this proof also on video? In fact, it is so, Your Honor. However, I can give you an example of what I mean if you answer me a few questions. Let me get this straight, Mr. Carter. You think you can prove that this court is biased against your client by asking me a few questions. This is right? Yes, Your Honor, said Uncle Jack. Okay, Mr. Carter, ask your questions. However, if you cannot prove your point, we will listen to the recording in my office, and I will make a decision on its admissibility. I will agree with that, Your Honor, but you should know that if this video is found to be inadmissible for purposes of this trial and my client is convicted on the evidence three witnesses for the prosecution, I will publish this video on news stations and on the Internet, no matter what the court decides. Additionally, the evidence in this video is such that your integrity will be questioned for not releasing it in court. I feel threatened, Mr. Carter, the judge said. Without waiting for the judge to get even angrier, Uncle Jack asked, Your eldest son is studying, isn't it, Your Honor? He goes to the Air Force Academy, right? Yes, answered the judge. He is a freshman. Appointments to the Air Force Academy are very competitive, aren't they? The judge replied, yes. First, your son should have approached your district's congressman or senator. After this, he had a civil service exam scheduled. Based on the results of this examination, he was nominated along with nine other young people. He was sent to a nearby Air Force base where he underwent a medical examination, a physical fitness test, and tests on his pilot and navigator abilities. In addition, he had to pass an entrance test to test his learning ability. Is all this correct, Your Honor? Yes, answered the judge. He was an excellent student in high school and signed up for the swim team every year. It is clear that you are very proud of him, Your Honor. State your point of view, Mr. Carter, the judge said. 
Your son's application package also contained three letters of recommendation, correct? That's right, Mr. Carter. Who were these letters from, Your Honor? Let's see. One was from his swimming coach and the other was from his math teacher. Who wrote the third letter, Your Honor? The judge was silent for a minute, but finally spoke. Mr. Stanley Cross wrote my son a recommendation for admission to the Air Force Academy. Mr. Cross must have known your son very well, unless he wrote a letter full of lies, said Uncle Jack. My son worked in Mr. Cross's office during his second and third summer breaks from high school. He wants to become a lawyer someday. So Mr. Cross is a family friend? He is an acquaintance of mine, more than a family friend, and my professional partner in some of the legal organizations to which I belong. So now, Your Honor, you can imagine how the defense views your impartiality in this matter, Uncle Jack concluded his questioning. The judge answered him, You have put me in a situation that calls into question my personal integrity, Counselor. Let me assure you that whatever connection I have or have with Mr. Cross will have no bearing on my decision-making process, but you've made it a matter of perception. The judge sat silently for a minute and then looked up and said, Play your video, Counselor. Uncle Jack motioned for the bailiff to dim the courtroom lights and lower the two large projection screens on either side of the judge's bench. Uncle Jack looked at me and said, Showtime, Blake. He pressed the enter button and the video began to play. The entire event unfolded for the judge, the prosecution, and the spectators in the courtroom. At that moment in the video, Cross threatened me and said, I personally know most of the senior police officials. I'm friends with a lot of the lawyers in the DA's office. In fact, I even slept with several of them. Came a loud sigh from the prosecution bench. The assistant district attorney lowered her head to the table and began to sob. We all watched her for a few seconds until she put the documents in her briefcase, stood up, and hurried out of the courtroom, still crying. Uncle Jack continued watching the video. Cross, Max, and Tracy all stood up together and tried to quietly leave the courtroom, but were easily spotted. The judge told them in no uncertain terms to remain seated. The remaining assistant district attorneys watched the video to the end. The chief prosecutor quickly stood up when the video ended. It was clear that he wanted to take a break, but before he could ask for it, Uncle Jack said, I have another video. Without waiting for permission, Uncle Jack queued up a second video and explained how it had been filmed two weeks earlier while my wife was visiting me at my townhouse. He then pressed enter and the video began to play. Tracy understood the meaning of the video. On it, she confessed to everything that Cross tried to do to me. She screamed, Blake, how could you do this to me? After the video played for a few minutes, Cross also realized how terrible it was. You stupid bitch. You stupid, stupid bitch. You let him record you. What were you thinking? He asked with rage. Tracy never realized when she visited me that I had set up my iPhone to record everything she said. The phone lay on the coffee table in front of her, hidden by books and papers. I turned it on just before I opened the door to let her in. In fact, the DA's office did request a recess to evaluate new evidence. Uncle Jack gave them copies of the videos on DVDs. The trial was adjourned until the next morning. When the court sat the next morning, three prosecution witnesses were conspicuously absent. This time, instead of an acting district attorney, the actual county district attorney sat at the prosecution table. The judge gave him the opportunity to speak first. I'll be brief, Your Honor, he began. First, all charges against Mr. Ramsey have been dropped. We believe he acted in self-defense when he took action against Mr. Cross and Mr. Angel. It was quite tough self-defense, but it was self-defense. Second, my office has issued arrest warrants for Mr. Stanley Cross, Mr. Max Angel, and Mrs. Tracy Ramsey for conspiracy to commit perjury, bribery of perjury, perjury, assault with intent to cause great bodily harm, making false oral and written statements to the police, filing false complaints, and obstruction of justice. Additionally, my office was alerted to the fact that Mr. Cross was attempting to plant false evidence against Mr. Ramsey. Mr. Angel and Mrs. Ramsey knew about it. 
We have also identified two suspects who worked for Mr. Cross who were attempting to plant false evidence, and we are currently in the process of arresting them. Stanley Cross, Max Angel, and my wife were arrested. They eventually posted bail. The district attorney was enraged by the news that his organization had been compromised for years by Stanley Cross, and he set about rooting out all of his colleagues who were associated with Stanley Cross in any ambiguous way. All defendants were eventually convicted. Stanley Cross was the only one who tried to defend himself, declaring his innocence. This was a mistake because both Max and Tracy pleaded guilty and testified against Cross. As a result, Stanley Cross received 11 years in prison. Max was given a seven-year sentence. Tracy received a three-year prison sentence. Tracy's original sentence was five years, but Uncle Jack arranged for me to speak on Tracy's behalf. I noted that during the fight, Tracy warned me that Cross was going to hit me from behind with a fireplace poker, and if it hadn't been for her, there was a good chance I would have been dead. Jose and Miguel were arrested for attempting to obstruct justice and tampering with evidence. As part of the arrest, police also confiscated their files and computers. On the computer, the police found a file with a prohibited video file, which they tried to download to my mobile phone. The district attorney played one villain against the other until Miguel broke down and confessed in hopes of getting a lighter sentence from the judge. They both went to prison for a long time. Stanley Cross was held in the county until he was transferred to state prison to begin serving his sentence. Max and Tracy, however, were given two weeks to get their affairs in order before they had to surrender to the sheriff and be taken into custody. Max spent his time preparing his family for life for seven years without him. With luck and good behavior, his lawyer told him he could be paroled in four years. Tracy due to her relatively short sentence, was going to spend her time in a prison annex in a rural part of the county. This was another provision that Uncle Jack negotiated with the court. I let Tracy stay in our house with the kids while I stayed in the townhouse until she had to move out. She spent time communicating with them and preparing them for her long absence. They were too young to understand everything that was happening, but they understood that Mom had done something wrong and she would have to leave for a while. The day before Tracy was scheduled to report to the sheriff, she asked me to come the next morning after she dropped the kids off at school. She wanted me to take all my clothes with me and be ready to move into the house. I showed up at 9 a.m. and rang the bell. Tracy replied, You didn't have to ring the bell to get in. This is your home. Tracy was wearing a simple knee-length black skirt, a white blouse, and a light gray sweater. She was wearing flat shoes. She wore very little makeup, and her hair was pulled back into a simple ponytail. Her eyes were reddish, and I was sure she had been crying most of the time since she sent the kids to school. However, she fought back tears over our meeting and did a good job of keeping herself under control. I noticed a small bag sitting by the front door. With a slight sense of humor, Tracy said, That's all I take with me. I think that the state will supply me with everything I need for some time. Tracy invited me into the kitchen, where she prepared a light breakfast. I sat at the kitchen table while she served a continental breakfast of scones with honey and jam, fruit cups, milk, coffee, and salad. The conversation started with small talk. She told me that Lucy would arrive at 11 a.m. to take her downtown to the sheriff's office. She emphasized that Lucy was more than willing to help with the children in any way she could. In fact, Lucy has volunteered to be the children's mother for the next few years, and I shouldn't hesitate to overstay her welcome. She wanted me to move in time for the kids to get home from school. She wanted their lives to continue as uninterruptedly as possible. Tracy was ambivalent about visits while she was in prison. She really didn't want her children to see her in an orange jumpsuit in prison, but she couldn't imagine not seeing them for three years. In addition, she promised to write often and wanted me to promise that the children would write to her every week or so. She asked me to send pictures of them growing up. Tracy indicated that she had packed all her belongings, everything, as she emphasized, into plastic containers and stored them in the basement storage room. She actually hung a family photo of all of us from a year or so ago in each of the kids' bedrooms so they wouldn't forget it. 
She told me that she had ordered a new king-size bed for the master bedroom. She had arrived a few days earlier and was completely ready. She said no one slept on it. She even bought all new sheets and pillowcases and a new blanket. The more she spoke, the more her eyes watered. Until this moment, we did not talk about ourselves. When she started clearing the table, I told her to stop and said I would do it later. I suggested that we go into the living room with our coffee. She looked at her watch and realized that she had very little time left. Tracy was very remorseful. She reminded me more of the woman I married than the woman she became under the influence of Stanley Cross. Blake, she began, I can't tell you how sorry I am for what I did and the way I treated you. You were the best husband, father, and provider in the world. You were my best friend and my wonderful lover. Never forget it, like I did. I take full responsibility for my actions. Although Stanley Cross was the devil and I fell under his spell, I made decisions that led me to hell. I feel so ashamed. That's all I can do. Not only for you, but also for our families, friends, and even children. In a way, I'm glad I'm going somewhere where I won't have to face you and you won't be able to see me. I know that you will never forget what I did, but I hope that with time it will become a distant memory and that someday you will be able to forgive me. This is what I live for now. Tracy finished what she wanted to tell me. She held back her tears long enough to stand up and ask me if I wanted more coffee. I stood in front of her. We stood face to face as I placed my hands on her shoulders and pulled her towards me in a hug. Her arms wrapped around me and hugged me very tightly, and she began to cry. We held each other for an unknown number of minutes. Her crying turned into intermittent sobs and then just sobs. She finally stopped talking and seemed content to just hug me tightly. We remained in this position until we heard a car horn outside. It must be Lucy, Tracy said. I asked her to honk the horn rather than approach the door, and now I need to go. She pushed me away, wiped the tears from her face, and picked up her sweater and suitcase. As she opened the door to leave, she turned and said, I love you, Blake. I stood in the doorway as Tracy walked up to Lucy's car. Lucy waved at me without smiling, and I waved back. A few minutes later, they were out of sight. I spent the rest of the morning moving my things back into the house. About two hours later in the afternoon, Lucy called and asked if I needed anything. I didn't want to be alone, so I asked her to come over. Plus, we probably had a lot to discuss about our roles in raising my children. In the end, the children and I got used to living without their mother. I was essentially a single father. Thus, I was dedicated to the well-being of Tyler, Beth, and Emily. Lucy was a great help and truly became a role model mother to the children. Lucy and I both decided to give Tracy about a month to get used to her new surroundings before we went with her. Lucy went first and took the children. When they returned, they were enthusiastic about visiting Tracy and Lucy said, Tracy was overcome with emotion to see her children again. Lucy explained that it was not as traumatic as we thought because the women's section of the prison had a day room where female prisoners could meet their children or other loved ones. The day room was a large area, furnished sofas, tables, and toys for the youngest children. Prisoners were allowed to wear civilian clothing such as dresses, skirts, and sweaters rather than prison uniforms. There was even an enclosed area outside the day room with picnic tables where the family could enjoy a family-friendly meal together. The first time I came, I was pleasantly surprised to see how casual the welcome area was, and I was happy that Tracy could introduce herself to her children in such an environment. I visited Tracy during her third month of imprisonment. She was glad to see me. And surprisingly, I was glad to see her. Her attitude was upbeat and positive, especially when we were with the children. In private, she again expressed deep remorse for what she had tried to do to me and told me that she would never forgive herself and would not expect me to ever forgive her. During one of our visits, Tracy's friend came to the table and introduced herself. Tracy explained that her friend's name was Candy, and she also had small children visiting her. At one point, Candy called Tracy stupid, as if that were her nickname. After Candy left, Tracy explained that all her friends called her stupid. 
She said that when everyone found out that she had a wonderful husband, a happy home and loving children, and then she left it all for a dirty affair, they decided that she was the dumbest person in prison. That's why they called her a fool. She explained that the lifestealer she gave up was what most female prisoners dream it of. A year passed, and thanks to her exemplary behavior, it became clear that Tracy could be paroled in just a year. Lucy and I thought we should start making long-term plans for Tracy's return. Uncle Jack suggested that based on Tracy's legal background, she might want to take some online courses to become a paralegal. Paralegals There was a shortage of local law firms, and it would have been a well-paying profession if Tracy had been interested. She agreed and enrolled in online courses at the University of Virginia. Meanwhile, Lucy and I were making plans for Tracy's post-prison life arrangements. We found a small two-bedroom townhouse with a garage nearby, close to the courthouse and nearby law offices in town. With only a moderate amount of investment, we purchased the place with the understanding that Tracy would eventually pay us back for our sponsorship of her home. The day she was released, Lucy went alone to pick her up because the paperwork and procedures were not conducive to a family event. When Lucy pulled up to Tracy's new house with a welcome home sign, Tracy began to sob. She was a complete wreck by the time she got out of the car. Her family came out to meet her. This included her parents, my parents, and, of course, the children. Even Uncle Jack and his wife were there. I kind of stayed in the background. The children showed her her new home, which was sparsely furnished with secondhand furniture. They took her to the back patio where I was cooking barbecue and hamburgers. We served her a glass of wine and seated her in the VIP chair. The children served her a hamburger, potato salad, and beans. Eventually, Tracy stopped crying and adjusted to the happy situation. She expressed her gratitude to everyone for being so accepting of her despite what she had done. Nobody referred to the past. At one point, in a private conversation, Uncle Jack told her that he had several interviews scheduled for her at various law firms. He wanted her to write a resume and cover letter for potential employers. He also recommended one law firm in particular. It was a law firm with a family practice that he had contacted and thought would be interesting. Tracy was so grateful. After Tracy had settled in for a week or so, and after she had been hired by the law firm Uncle Jack had set her up with, she asked me to come to her house alone for dinner. I showed up with a bottle of wine. She hugged me when I walked through the door. Tracy made my favorite dinner, which was a simple meatloaf with casserole potatoes and peas. During dinner, we talked about everything except what she wanted to talk about. We talked about the children, about my work, about her work, and about the weather. After dinner, we moved into the living room, where Tracy turned on some melodious background music from the music channel on the TV. I invited you tonight, Blake, she said, because I wanted to talk about us. Or maybe I should talk about you and me. What will happen to you and me? It's so hard for me to imagine the future. I answered, I don't have a crystal ball either, Tracy. But I think what's likely to happen is that we'll continue to raise our kids as a team. I think they need you as much as I think they need me. Frankly, having you home has taken a lot of weight off my shoulders. I now have a certain amount of free time that I didn't have before. And I think you'll also enjoy the free time you'll have without kids getting in the way all the time. Unlike you, I had a moderate social life. Nothing serious, but it was nice to go on a date, dinner, and a movie every now and then. Once you're more settled, I think you'll also enjoy a more active social life. Tracy chimed in. Do you think you'll ever be interested in me on a regular basis again? I answered, If you mean, would I ever want to marry you again? The answer is no. Too much has happened to ever think about marrying you again. However, I have survived what happened in the past, and I look forward to being friends with you forever, without any advantages. But we will never be closer than we are now. Tracy looked down and a few tears appeared on her cheek. I knew it, but I had to try. I expect that, over the next few years, I will become more social and date more seriously. Sooner or later, I will find another woman to love. She may be single, divorced, or widowed. She may or may not have children of her own. 
but I will meet someone and ask her to marry me, and I expect the same to happen to you. As you adjust more fully to your new life, you will eventually meet someone you can love, and this someone will ask you to marry him. This won't stop us from seeing each other often because we will always have children to tie us together. We will be together for birthdays, holidays, and maybe even vacations. There will be graduations and weddings in the future. This is the best we can hope for when it comes to being together. This is probably more than I deserve, Tracy said sadly. But I can be happy with this future. Before you go, I want you to know that I am forever grateful for the way you have treated me since I came home. I couldn't blame you if you avoided me completely and kept the kids away from me. But you didn't. You didn't do this because you are a wonderful person who loves your children. It makes me even more regretful that I did what I tried to do to you. When I opened the door to leave, I replied, You may or may not have noticed it, Tracy, but I have forgiven you. I have no animosity towards you. In time, I hope you forgive yourself. Maybe in time I will be able to do it, but it won't be soon, Tracy replied. At the same time, we hugged each other. We hugged for several minutes without saying anything. I let her go and, without saying anything else, went out into the fresh air, found my car, and drove home. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.